we welcome you all, our dear viewers, to this week's community show. In this show, we talk about issues that pertain communities in Uganda. And many times, the feedback we have got has been that this show indeed is changing lives, and this show indeed is impacting on communities and also influencing policymakers, among other stakeholders. Today, we want to talk about um, something that is commonplace in very many cultures in Uganda, but also something that pertains to girls. Now, according to the World Bank, and of course also consequently to UNICEF, 34% of girls in Uganda are sexually engaged or, in, yes, sexually engaged and encounter um, points where they are in some sort of marriage before the age of 19 and 7% before the age of 15. There is an increasing number of child marriages in Uganda, and the situation was exacerbated by COVID-19. The numbers soared. This brings into question whether Uganda as a country is taking steps to ending child marriages. And talking about steps on the 21st, if I'm not mistaken, of February 2023, the Constitutional Court in Uganda clearly came out and declared unconstitutional the practice of child marriage as had been uh, put in a number of uh, laws, among them the Hindu Marriages Act, the Customary Marriages Act, and I think the Mohammedan uh, laws that put the age of marriage for girls below the age of 18. The court said that marrying of children before 18 years, all girls being married before 18 years is unconstitutional and could not be uh, entertained. And as such, any such marriages are unlawful. Now, to help us further discuss this issue of child marriages, I am child marriages and late, and also late in the second part of our conversation, we shall talk about menstrual um, hygiene, menstrual sanitation, menstrual care of, of girls in Uganda. To help me further this conversation, I'm joined by Linda, Nehemiah, Marion, and Hope. I'll ask, um, them to introduce themselves, beginning with Linda, Nehemiah, Marion, and consequently Hope. I'm by the names of Linda Tumhairi. I'm a social worker and a parent as well. Hello, viewers and listeners. My name is um, Stella Marion Akeno. I am a communication Excel consultant and also um, into policy. Hello, everyone. Greetings from Raising Teenagers Uganda. I'm Natkunda Nehemiah Program, the Associate Raising Teenagers Uganda, uh, a father of girls and boys, definitely, a husband, a social worker, and a lover of prosperity who believes in uplifting others. We rise by lifting others. That's what I believe in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nehemiah. And I'll begin. I'll begin. You've seen that upward. To UNICEF, 34% of, uh, of girls are married off before, <laughs> are married off before um, the majority age, which is 18. And of course, now help us understand, um, help our audience understand what child marriages are indeed. To, to someone who may not necessarily know, in simple terms, what someone talks about child marriages, over to you, Nehemiah. Yeah, in simple terms, child marriage, this is where young 
boys and girls, because I don't want us to target on only girls. This is where young boys and girls are forced or endured or set into getting into long-term relationships with, with people of the opposite sex at an early age. For example, for us in Uganda, uh, we take that people who are of age to get married or in two long-term relationships should be 18 and above. But we find and see people who get married willingly, or rather unwillingly, being forced into marriages at an early age of even 13, even 12, even 9. During my work, I've met someone who has been married off at nine years. So... And uh, that's the situation in Ghana. So that's the child marriage that we are talking about. Those who are being married off at an early age before the constitutionally agreed age of 18. So those who are 17 and below. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, and indeed, you've also mentioned boys, for sure. Yes, and indeed, in this UNICEF finding, they, they, they found that 6% of, of boys are married before the age of 18. So it's not only, um, although it affects girls most, it's not only uh, exclusive to, to girls. Now, I want to come to you, uh, uh, Linda. Uh, what are some of um, the causes of... Uh, child in Uganda. Thank you, moderator, and hello, everyone. <clears throat> like we've, my fellow panelists has already told you what child marriage is. In this case, I'm going to look at the two different sexes, the boys and the girls, yes. For, for a case in Uganda, you find that certain communities or societies are still attached to those old beliefs that girls a case in point that girls are not important people in society. So they believe that sending these girls in for marriage would be more important to them because they believe they will be getting dowries and the likes. I think one of the causes of that child marriage are the so-called traditional beliefs. And then another thing, the parents or some people still believe that it is costly to bring up a girl child. And they think once a girl is sent in for marriage, or even a case in point even the boys, they will have reduced on the cost of spending in their families. Then another thing, it's greed. Some parents are greedy. They look at these girls as a source of, of income to them. They believe when they exchange their girls into, when they send their girls into marriage, they will get money, they will get these tangible things. So I think I would term that as greed on the side of the parents. Then another thing, we, there's lack of, lack of sensitization. Some parents are sending in girls, especially into marriage, early marriages, because they lack information, they lack knowledge. They have not been made aware to see the importance, the worth, the value of these girls in society. So they believe that these girls, when they, they are sent into marriage, it is so they lack information. So I think in case they are sensitized or given basic knowledge that these girls are important and they are still young and there may be their problems attached in sending girls into early marriages, I think they would really wake up and hence deal, we deal with that cause of the early marriages in girls. Thank you, moderator. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. And uh, to you, Maria, I would like to hear, you know, from your own research context, it, what propels these uh, child marriages in Ugandan communities? Uh, thank you so much, Alex. I thought it would be wonderful maybe just to step back a bit and understand what norms are and then connect it back to um, how how it how it pushes for uh, child marriages. So I would like to um, first define what social norms are for our our viewers to actually understand what it is maybe if it's someone someone interfacing with the term for the first time. So mm -hmm. social norms are perceived informal, mostly unwritten rules that define acceptable or appropriate uh, action within a given group or community. 
So these are, these are rules, these are beliefs um, or appropriate behavior that people think how things should happen, even if it's not written anywhere, maybe because people before us did them. So we think it's the right thing to do and we keep on holding to such behaviors and not acknowledging that times are actually changing. Okay, so um, if you don't conform to some of those rules, some people may feel like uh, you're not doing things the right way because they feel like um, that's how things have to be done as long as you belong to that community. So these are some of the beliefs that have actually continued to make sure um, we still have um, child marriages existing, okay? So now to answer the question you just posed, um, child marriages, um, has two roots, uh, it's rooted in two sets of beliefs and norms. One of them are the cultural beliefs rooted in the moral concepts of honor, doing the right thing for your child, okay? Uh, this is closely tied to being a responsible parent. The second belief or norm that is in our society is tied to social economic factors, e.g. Uh, related to dowry price, or bride price, which is uh, socially united families, strengthening social networks or economic advantages to families like uh, the, the last speaker mentioned, Linda, I think, yeah, Linda mentioned. So maybe just to point out a few, one, parents who marry off their daughters early are honored by the community. It's just a belief, but it's not like it's true, but these are cultural beliefs rooted in honor. You think uh, if you marry off your, your daughter to a good family because they have extended a hand to you, you feel like, yes, I'll be respected in community. The other thing is they say girls who marry off early achieve high status among their peers. Where is this written? We have all these things in our communities, people feeling superior because they're married and their age means are not married. But it's because these are cultural beliefs that society continues to push. The other thing is around um, uh, a girl who, who, who continues to menstruate or gets her first period in her parents' house because it brings misfortune to the family. Who said that? These things are not written, but certain communities believe that once a girl starts to receive her periods, it's time for her to leave the father's house. So for them, it means the girl is mature. These are just beliefs, and these beliefs are actually affecting the young girls today. Sometimes the beliefs rotate around that a girl who gets, a, who gets pregnant while in her father's house brings, brings dishonor and shame to the family. So you find that when girls get pregnant, even if they're not yet of age, the parents are kicking them out of the home to go and get married. And I can tell you, this is among one of the reasons we have so many young girls in, in child marriages. If you go deep down in these villages, in these rural settings, once a girl becomes pregnant, let's say, um, and most times it's accident because they're at that age where they're just experimenting and before you know it, a girl is pregnant. The parents feel like they don't have to be responsible for them anymore because uh, they term them as bringing disgrace to their family or bringing shame to the family. So they are pushed away from home, they are chased away from home. But because these girls don't have any other alternative, they go to, they go and get married. And before they know it, they have a second child and then they don't have any way out. So they find themselves stuck in these marriages years down the road. Um, the other belief that most communities hold is that um, respectable girls get married before they are 18 years of age. By the way, when we talk about these things here, you feel like, mm, because for us, we are now exposed. But if you go deep down in the village or in certain communities that are not yet exposed, this is how people think. I know communities of people whereby um, when you reach a certain age and you're not married, when you clock 18 and you're not married and all your peers are married, they look at you as someone who's cast. Because in those communities, girls get married early. Okay, but then, um, so these are the different norms that you find that uh, they play a factor in, in what happens um, around child marriages. And these are some of the things as society, um, we have to set right. So um, yeah, I think that's what I would say as some of the uh, social, social norms that contribute to, um, to child marriages. Thank you so much.
Thank you uh, for that. Uh, Nehemiah, would you want to add something to uh, what the other colleagues have said in regard to what essentially causes these uh, um, absurd practices? Uh, Mr. Natukunda, yes, yes. Would you wish to add something on what the colleagues have said? Yes, Martin, uh, rather Alex, sorry. Yeah, I think um, Akieno is right. Her presentation is uh, spot on on point. Uh, peer pressure is key. Then social beliefs in our communities are key. Uh, then definitely, yes, uh, poverty, looking at girls as a source of income. We be married off and we accumulate wealth, we get these cows, we get these goats, we get these gifts has also greatly uh, contributed to child marriages. So as, as social workers, as we go on, we need to see how to incorporate in uh, economic empowerment to our backward, back, uh, backward, I don't want to call it backward, but the less advantaged families who practice these child marriages, we need to see how to incorporate in the component of uh, economic empowerment. Thank you very much. Uh, we can continue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. And, uh, you know, having defined what it is and looked at the social norms that indeed uh, social and economic norms that are drivers to these uh, child marriages, I would want us now to, 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 to handle the part of what can we do? Um, we as stakeholders, we, I mean, we as citizens, people, what can government do, what can parents do, what can communities do, you know, and communities is large, everyone in communities from uh, owners of schools, schools, um, religious leaders, cultural leaders, I mean, what can be done to um, end this uh, harmful practice that child marriage is? Over to you, Linda. Thank you, Martin. I think we need to put across or call upon massive education to the various stakeholders, that is to the parents, the community, the religious leaders, the, the schools or the school administrators. So I believe a lot of education, which entails, I think, awareness and sensitization needs to be put across. In this education, we need to teach or tell the community the disadvantages of sending these girls into marriages when they're still early. We need to make it clear that once these girls are sent into marriage at an early stage, it comes along with negative consequences. For example, we need to tell them, once these girls have been sent into marriage, there are high chances of those early pregnancies and the early pregnancies, they increase risks of death, both to the, this girl child who is termed as a mother and to the child in case at the point of delivery. And then we need to make them clear that there are also diseases which come along with these early marriages of these children, because we need to make them see that these children or these girls' bodies are not yet ready to, to, to embrace certain things like being pregnant. Eh? We need to sensitize the communities or the various stakeholders that there is a lot of risks involved once these girls are taken to marriages like sexual abuse. Eh? Then another thing, there will be lots of violence from the husbands because these girls, most cases they are immature. They are still young. And on another side, they've been forced into marriages without their consent. So we need to really put up massive education, telling communities, telling the various stakeholders the dangers of sending these girls into marriages. And we need to make also it clear before the communities that these girls are very important. Once given chance to grow up, go to school and study, because we've come to realize that once these girls are sent into marriages when they're still early, their chances of education have been reduced their chances of education have been reduced. They cannot go to school and study and get a certain profession. So we need to really teach the masses, the communities. These girls are important. They need to be given time to grow up and 
go into marriages at the rightful age, at the consent age, and also consent from the girls also. Then I think another thing in our education, we need to make it clear to deal with those social norms and the beliefs that people have embedded in their minds that it's not costly having a girl child at home, no. They should look at it at a, as, a, as an advantage, a privilege as a parent to bring up your child to grow up, go to school, study, and be someone of importance in future. Then I think apart from the education, we need to put up across serious laws. And these laws, once they are put across, they need to be enforced. So we are calling upon the, the political leaders, the community leaders, the religious leaders to hope, work in hand. Once these laws are put into place, they are really followed up to be enforced. They find a parent sending a child into early marriage, you are punishable for that. And another thing, another thing, we need to also look at the side of the parents. Well, some parents are sending in children into early marriages because of they want that that income, that dowry. They think that dowry is going to make lives, you know, better. So we need to also teach or sensitize the parents that they need to go out and work. That certain skills need to be availed to them. Join up clubs, community clubs. Eh, get involved into various activities, farming, get knowledge to, uh, to be able to earn a source of living rather than sending these girls for early marriages. Thank you, moderator. Thank you very much, um, uh, Linda, for, for that. Well, of course, thank you for bringing in the aspect of uh, the disadvantages, which we, you know, uh, we hadn't actually even looked at. And and it's it's important, of course, for for us to highlight what some of those disadvantages are before we even go to the solutions. And I'll ask the uh, the different um, the moder uh, the different panelists, conversationists, to also point to us, you know, some of those disadvantages of this harmful practice that child marriage is. I want to yes, you also mentioned pregnancies, and indeed, um, pregnancies have been early, all teenage pregnancies have been indeed associated to child marriages. And uh, in, the, in their report, uh, UNFPA and UNICEF of 2020, um, it showed that 25% of the 1.2 million pregnancies recorded in Uganda, 25% um, were, were for, um, were by teenage mothers, you know, that means, uh, and many of those, many times also end up in uh, unsafe abortions. Okay, about 300,000 of those pregnancies end up in unsafe abortions. And um, yeah, only about uh, one in, in, in five girls are able to access, you know, um, medication that is able to to make it easier for them to either bear that uh, pregnancy or many times where it's necessary uh, to have uh, to, to let go of the pregnancy. And this has also caused, uh, has risked a lot of maternal death, you know, because of unsafe methods of abortion um, that teenage mothers endure because of the social norms, because of all these things that we've mentioned. We also see a number, a high, an increase in um, teenage uh, mothers. And indeed, they have said the risk of maternal death are even higher among teenage mothers, and it accounts to about 28%. And this is how dangerous it is. So I, yes, to you, Marion, please help, help share some of the um, disadvantages, some of the adverse effects that uh, child marriages have on uh, on society on top of those that linda has uh, has has highlighted yes uh, we we we've understood that of course child marriage is a danger but do you may you please point to us some of those um, um disadvantages to of course the girl to society that are associated to uh uh child marriages or teenage um marriage Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Linda. 
Uh, just like uh, you've been pointing out that um, child marriages have a lot of uh, disadvantages in our communities. I think I would also like to note that um, most of these girls get married when they're not mature. So they don't yet have a sense of self-awareness within themselves, that's number one. And this exposes them to vulnerability um, in, the, in the community and even in their marriages, and we are going to have, end up having dysfunctional families generation after generation. Because a child raising another child, what are they supposed to give to the other child? You may ask. And then how do we expect the next generation to be better if the generation we have now isn't doing better? So there is need for um, to make sure our mothers are empowered to be in position to raise better people for the next generation. But most of these young people are still growing up themselves. So the community loses, but then as individuals, they also lose out on the joy of living, on enjoying their human rights as people. They don't get to actually know what the meaning of life is because as they're still children and still trying to find themselves, they already have responsibilities. And that's why sometimes we have increased cases of suicide. We have increased cases of gender-based violence because these are young kids who don't know yet how life is supposed to be or how to do life. They don't know yet how to take on the pressure of life. So because there's so much frustration because we have said uh, child marriages happens for both young boys and young girls. So just look at the, in the case of both of them are young and then they are together. They don't know how to navigate certain situations about life. So you find that we have increased cases of gender-based violence because the boy child is not yet a man, a real man, because he's still trying to navigate life itself. And then on this one hand, the girl child is still trying to understand themselves. So um, there's a lot of growth that needs to happen. And sometimes the community that, that doesn't provide that kind of space. So you find you come in communities and all the girls, all the boys are, are married young and there's no development happening in a community because no one can think beyond today. They're so caught up in trying to raise their children that they don't have time to think of how to develop or how to grow because they haven't been empowered to do that. So I think for me, I know communities like to look on and feel like it's not their problem, but it's actually their problem when these things continue to happen. You lose out on key resources. You lose out on, uh, on people that would actually support that community to grow. As a family, you lose out on, 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 bec on, on becoming better because this same thing keeps on happening over and over and over. And then we have families caught up in generational, generational poverty because we don't choose the right choices, choices today. So you find this family, generation after generation, all the girls get married early because that's the example that has been set. So it's something that affects all generations unless you decide to to to, to set the to set the, the to set it straight so i feel like it's important um for that to be set straight and then also we've had issues of um because of early child marriages there's a lot of hiv hiv is spreading so fast like i say most of these young people don't know what to do with life yet they're just navigating it as they learn about life and then responsibility is thrown at them. And you find that the young girls or the young, the young men, or sometimes they get married to more mature people, have multiple sex, sexual partners. What this does is that we shall keep having HIV prevalence in the country because no one is taking the necessary steps to educate the young people in our communities because everyone is minding about their own business and not realizing minding their business is actually affecting the growth of that community. So um, child marriages are so bad and it's something we have to look, look into as, as a community. The other thing would be around, um, we've had a high rate of deaths. These girls are not yet women, they're just babies. 
and they're having babies. So we've had cases whereby uh, sometimes they can't even access proper, proper health care. Um, sometimes they can't even afford it. Sometimes they resort to using local, local hubs and everything. Uh, and you find that we've lost so many lives. So many lives, so many bright futures. Uh, so many young women have lost their bright future because they can't access the proper medical health. And they don't understand what it means to be in a marriage or to be pregnant because they have not been prepared. They have not had the time to actually mentally prepare or their bodies are not yet physically prepared to have babies. The few that are lucky, maybe because um, they, they have good families or, or they're in a better place, actually are the ones that uh, make it out. But most girls always end up dead. Most girls always end up with diseases that they can't, find, they can't even afford to find treatment for. Sometimes we end up with a high mortality rate because these people can't access the best healthcare in their state of mind or because they don't have yet the resources. So for me, this is an issue that needs to be tackled by all concerned stakeholders as they, the risks are way too high. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh very much, Marion, for that uh, passionate, uh, you know, presentation. We, and this Nehemiah is next. And uh, before you come, Nehemiah, we are seeing the government of Uganda indeed uh, doing, taking some steps to end child marriages. We are seeing other partners and indeed in compliance with the uh, SDG 5.3, and um, a lot is, 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 is happening. The laws in Uganda are actually, we must say, are in place to enter marriages. We have seen, you know, our constitution, um, the various acts, the children, you know, the Children's Act, uh, the Marriage Act, all those ones that uh, state that marriage is between people who are above 18. And... Um, yeah, we must. We could say maybe the government has done its part. There is, um, Alisa has taken some steps to 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 end this, and their partners, etc., that are doing the best they can. In your view, uh, as a social worker and as someone who is active in this field, what more should be done to to end this? Because as we've seen, government and everyone still doing. There's still a lot. There's still, a, a, there's still a big number of um, child marriages, 8.9 million people, you know, being married before all engaging before the 18th birthday is not a small number. And, uh, you know, about uh, almost 2 million before the age of 15, that's still a big number. What still can we do? What can be, be done? Uh, over to you, Nehemiah. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, what more can we do? Now, uh, this is through experience. When we go down there as social workers, as, uh, as people who fear about child marriage and we endeavor to, to see that we accelerate, what we call accelerate progress to ending child marriage. Uh, few things we need to do. When we go to the community and put there our information and come back, what's the follow-up? How can we continue re-echoing re what we've been doing? One, let's try every time we go to the community, create what we would call like champions. I've been in a certain area, but I have left. I can't be everywhere. What is this? who is this person that is going to keep on re-echoing uh, the message, such that it keeps on vibing. Let me call it, let me use this word. It keeps on vibing in the ears of the people who are practicing it, the champions. And these are normally people with platforms. We have local politicians, the councillors, the chairmen, these people that are on ground that are with our daily people. Let's engage them. Let's give them the information that they need Let's try and empower them to keep on re-echoing our, our, our messages, the champions. We can use 
the local politicians, we can use the local uh, faith leaders. These are the sheikhs. Uh, we can use the religious leaders, the reverends, the, 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 the head of ladies and everyone. Actually, we can even use the teachers, the teachers themselves. They can be our champions. So that's number one. Two, let's also encourage the use of role models. In our communities, while we have child marriages, we even have those that have fought their way through and have survived the child marriages and they are there to show. Maybe we have this girl who went through all the system of education. She survived the child marriage. She's now doing well. And we can use that girl or use that boy, bring him or her back into the community and be like, this is one of us. She was here with us. She grew up from here. She went through education system. Now look at the amazing things that she is doing use of role models. Now, let's also not shy away from bringing up, as we work, bringing up the bad examples. We know, we know those who are in this year's sack of poverty simply because of child marriages. Let's not shy away from saying, but you see that family because they are marrying out their children when they are young, this has continued and there is no change. We have those that have died giving back simply because their bones, their body, their everything cannot handle. And we know, we know the families that have lost these people. Let's go and use them. Those, those examples will help. And the parent will be like, but do I want my daughter to die young? Definitely no. And what should I do? Then they will come to us. Now, another thing we can do, let's encourage the community to report. While the government has done its part into laws and everything, there is a problem of the community not reporting. Several reasons why they don't report. Maybe they report and their cases have not been followed, they have not been worked on, or they don't know where to report. So let's encourage the community to report. They are simple, even um, these days, almost everybody has a phone. We have Saudi Press. We are not promoting it. Okay? It's free of charge, totally free. They call, the Minister of uh, Gender will, will respond. We have community officers at every level. Of governance of our, of, of our county. But you see, this community need that. These social workers are at local levels. We also need to get information. So let the people be encouraged to report. Then let's also disseminate useful information. Not all information is supposed to be put out there. Let's disseminate useful information as social workers. Then in our work, we have seen that the biggest driver of uh, child marriage is poverty. Let's not shy away from it. The biggest driver is poverty. But in our work, can we incorporate in economic empowerment projects? Uh, for example, at Raising Teenagers, we started a simple project, a pilot study, where we found that, that actually a goat, a goat that costs, let's assume, at maybe at a cost of 200,000, saves a family when you get that goat and visit your family. It saves a girl from being married because a certain boy was coming to bring that goat into that family and they send away their girl. But when you bring those economic empowerment projects to them, you find that people have budget to go and do seminars, to go and do workshops. But if we can channel some of these things into economic empowerment, then uh, we, can, we can do something. But then, uh, lastly, not, um, not forgetting that while the government has done its part, let's continue engaging these policymakers. Imagine if a sub-county X made a bylaw and which is acceptable by the law by our constitution that a sub-county can sit and make a bylaw or even an LLC can sit and make a bylaw. It's acceptable. Made a bylaw that in our community, all school-going aged children must be, one, at school. Two, if we find a family that has married off a child, this is the punishment. And it is known in the community. Then it will be, will be like 80, 90% halfway to combat this, this violence. This virus. So me, I believe, engaging policymakers right from the ground, 
the top the parliament would help us go along with them too. Then, then uh, uh, without forgetting that these laws that the government has made, if you go and check, most of them have remained in the languages that we don't understand as a community. We need to put them in the languages that we understand as a community and make sure that the information gets to the ground. For example, look at that the period when we are into political campaigns, the information, the power, the energies that are put there during that period. If that energy and everything and the resources, half of it is put into fighting this, definitely our country would be better. Our nation would be better. So me, I believe we, if we continue to do the above, as mentioned, then we would be better and we'll be good to go as we fight child marriages. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nehemiah, for, for that. Now we want to, we would like to go into the last phase of our discussion, the second and also last phase of our discussion, and that is to do with our menstrual hygiene, you know, of girls. And I want to begin with, with, with you, Linda, to make us understand what menstrual hygiene is you know, for many of us who may not understand what indeed it is. Help us understand this phenomenon. Thank, that, you. Uh, Thank you, moderator. I think first and foremost, we need to remind ourselves, both the panelists and the viewers, what menstruation is. Menstruation, you find this is a monthly, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, Menstruation is a monthly, it is a situation whereby a woman monthly bleeds and that is termed as a period. So when you come to menstrual hygiene, menstrual hygiene, we look at it as, we need to really sit as women, sit as girls, and we see how to look at this situation. When you come to our societies or to look at the norms and the likes, you find that people have looked at the gender stereotypes of stigmatized menstruation as a dirty thing and shameful thing. So we need to really, as community workers, community people, to address the thing in this way that we need to make sure that menstruation is not is not a, a bad thing. It is a normal thing and it's a natural thing for every girl or every woman to go in to it once the time comes. So we really need to look at it in this way that we should embrace it. It's a natural thing and it's normal. So how do you look about the hygiene part of it? We really need to put across information or policies that will hope that girls or the women embrace it in such a way that they don't feel it's a very bad thing, it's a dirty thing, it's a shaming or what. So we need to really come up as community workers, avail products or supplies to the girl child, things like the sanitary pads, the sanitary beans, in case you are in those periods, how should you look at yourself? How should you care for yourself? And I think we also need to make it aware to our girls in society that once this time comes of the menstruation, don't feel shy and like you fear to go to school and just think people will look at you as an outcast in society or what or the likes. So we really need to talk to each other, talk to our girls, have those open talks, tell them this is a normal thing. Once it comes, don't feel shy, share with a parent, share with a friend and telling them what has happened to you. So in doing, this, in doing this, we shall be able to talk to these girls. Once it comes, you should learn to look after your bodies. Welcome meet with, with a clean heart. Don't fear, and you're like, society's going to look at me as what and the likes. So we should really come up as people. We talk openly to these girls that this thing is a normal thing, it's a natural thing. And society shouldn't really look at you as an- Very much for uh, opening it up uh, for us to understand it better and uh, 
yeah, it means not even for many of us that may not necessarily understand uh, that particular, who may not have had enough knowledge. Thank you. I want to reference um, a research that was done by the Red uh, Cross, you know, in Uganda, and they stated that sixty percent of girls miss up to three days of school attendance each month. You know, and of course, this affects uh, the academic uh, performance. For me, it's 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 worrying. Um, these are days missed, and uh, of course, many of them miss because the schools do not have the necessary amenities to help these girls manage uh, through, you know, in, in, in this time when uh, they're having their, you know, uh, periods. It's, it's, it's worrying and uh, I want uh, uh, you, Marion, to, yeah, to add on to help us further understand the importance of having infrastructure or having amenities that help girls in managing uh, the menstrual you know, period and how important it should be to all of us you know, when the girls are, are helped to, you know, to manage and they are helped to, to handle you know, this uh, part of their health. Help us, you know, uh, help us on in that discussion, dear Marion. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Alex. So it, it's sad to note that uh, menstruation is such um, a normal thing. It's part of nature, it's part of life. And yet as society, we still look at it in disgust, disgust and we still tend to view it as something that's alien, yet it's something that that brings life. It's something that births life. And it's something that everyone should be concerned about. Uh, but we find that in so many communities, it's looked down upon and um, they don't pro provide the necessary environment uh, for women to actually uh, go through the process well. So we, we have condoms in, and, in, in washrooms. I want to, yes, yes. You're going to, to, to indeed continue. I want to just give up. Uh, some information before we proceed, I, I felt I would forget it. In Kenya, I think it was on the, um, on 12, on, I think, in the second week of February, where a Kenyan member of parliament um, walked into uh, parliament. Of course, she had experienced, you know, she was in her menstrual uh, cycles, cycle, and she indeed, during that time, uh, was experiencing her periods maybe inadvertently or advantageously also to bring the cause of what girls go through in society. She had, you know, some blood on her pants, you know, and she entered parliament. What the reaction of her fellow members of parliament was, was so uh, marginalizing, it was so victimizing and stigmatizing that they actually even forced her out of parliament. I, I would, yeah. for those who haven't seen it, it's it, it is on social media, and if our producer will play it during, uh, can play it, you know, during the show, it would also be good. I will even share it with you, the panelists. Madrin can share, you know, this with you, that video. The entire parliament stood still and victimized this woman who was going through what every woman goes through. Mm -hmm. They showed how much they cast girls at the fringes yeah. of society, marginalizing them when they are having this, because it's supposed to be normal, but an entire parliament stopped and forced a fellow member of, you know, the House of Representatives, I think it was the Senate or, you know, their parliament, to go out for something that is, you know, supposed to be normal. And in any case, they didn't even ask whether, as, as them, the parliament, had put in place enough facilities or amenities to help their colleagues who are experiencing, uh, uh, you know, their periods. Yeah, I just wanted to bring that up, you know, before we forget. For context, please continue. Yeah, I think uh, when I saw that video and read the stories, I was like, wait, you know, every day we talk about these things and everyone else feels like mm, it's just talk. 
but this is really real. Like this is how people view menstruation. And it's sad because it's, it's this that gives life. Where does everyone come from? If only people would figure that out, they would actually appreciate this whole process of life itself. So uh, j just to add on, on to that story, uh, so the, 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 the honorable is called Gloria Oroba. Uh, she's, uh, she's Kenyan. So she, she was in parliament and fellow women were castigating her for turning up like that. Like how? You would expect women to be the first people to support you. But even us as women, if we look at it that way, that is something that's an man, something that is not supposed to be talked about. It's always the elephant in the room. That how do we expect the young girls to embrace this process? If at 40, at 50, you have not yet embraced this process as, as something that brings life, then how, what are we teaching the young girls? What are we telling them? Okay, so for me, it was so disturbing. And this is the conception in Africa. In most communities, this is how it's looked upon. So we would rather have condoms in washrooms, provide condoms everywhere, but we can't even provide pads. Like, what's that? I've sat in planning meetings when they're organizing events. Usually they think of condoms first. What's going on? So for me, I think uh, th there needs to be a shift. Um, and maybe just derailing away from the question, but I think there needs to be a shift whereby priorities giving to, uh, given to women to making sure these sanitary pads are actually free of charge. I know countries that have already done that. We have Scotland uh, just this month. Um, uh, Sierra Leone also joined the, the, the group. Now they're offering free pads across the country to different communities. We have, uh, uh, I think, New Zealand also joined the, the shift, the offering new pads, especially to communities that, that, that can't afford these things. In Uganda, pads are so expensive, and yet it's a necessity. Everything else, alcohol is much more cheaper than a pad. And yet it's something that every girl needs. So I think that needs to be looked up into, uh, but just responding to your question on what you think needs to be done to provide um, a friendly environment for young girls, especially when they're going through this process. I think uh, the challenges when it comes to menstruation is just more than just the free pads itself. It also has to do with making sure the environment is actually clean and safe. I can tell you, if you go to most of these schools, you will not find proper washrooms that can accommodate a girl to make sure they can change, to make sure they can wash up when they need to. It's not catered for. But I know in, in, in some other countries that are taking this seriously, when you go to the washrooms, there are taps, the, the bensons, the places that specifically women can go and change when they need to change. And it's, it's sad, most times in schools, they know they have girls, but then they don't cater for these things. They're supposed to cater for the washrooms to make sure that they don't keep the washrooms clean. They can't, um, they can't make, ensure that there's enough water in the place. They don't ensure there's soap in the place. These are basics that every woman needs when they're in that, when they're in the, when they're in that season. So I think that's the environment that is needed, aside from just providing the free sanitary, sanitary towels. So until we get to that place where we appreciate that these things have to be there, then I don't know where we're going. So even the Muslim community knows they have to provide water in washrooms and then they, they, they provide the pipes because people have to wash up. What's so hard about ensuring even the women can access such things in different places? It's a thing of priority, really. It's not like we can't do it, but it's a thing of just people not giving it priority. So it needs to be looked into. Well, thank you very much. And uh, yes, as you were speaking, I was also looking at indeed the statistics, and it's uh, it's worrying to see that uh, few you know schools, few um, girls have access to water in in, in 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 their facilities because these girls girls need water um, when they are going through you know uh, the menstrual cycles. Important to have plenty of water and clean water but it seems that it's still um it's still very 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 short in our communities in our schools and uh, there is a research that was done by I IRC 
where less than 50% of schools indeed even had washrooms, you know, and can be quite uh, lower. There is less access to, 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 to water, um, to sanitation. I mean, even be, before we even go to the bigger issue of, of pads, can we have water, you know, in, in, in these schools, in places, even in places of worship, you know, government facilities, can we have, you know, uh, uh, clean and safe water? Now, there are two things in discussion that have come, and all of you can comment on them. Is it time to have uh, com productive health, you know, uh, prioritized? Is it now time to even have it schools, you know, there's been a big debate on the comprehensive sexuality education, which component also includes um, some things to do with the uh, hygiene management, you know, of girls. Is it time now that the various stakeholders avoided this issue and welcomed it to create a society that is cognizant of of the situations of the girls, of what the girls uh, uh, go through. Secondly, the other question is, and this is directly to you, Nehemiah, is what is the role of men, you know, in 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 in, in this, as as equal uh, partners in life, as equal partners in this earth that God gave us. So those are the two things that I would want us to think about, and I would welcome all of you have a say about it. But first, I want Nehemiah to answer what the role of men, men and boys. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Now, uh, menstruation, menstruation, menstruation. Uh, I would like to put it so clearly that we are all what we are because our mothers menstruated. So, menstruation is life. No menstruation, no life. That's the bottom line. No menstruation, no life. And with that, when we have that at the back of our mind, the only way that we can make our, our sisters, our mothers, our daughters to menstruate with dignity, because that's what I like to call it, menstruating with dignity, we need to fight stigma around menstruation. That's the only way. We fight stigma around menstruation and the rest will follow. Because for example, what happened to the MP, the example you brought, is just stigma. So we need to fight that. We fight stigma around menstruation and the rest will follow. Because after fighting stigma, it will be normal and everybody will understand it. Because I normally like challenging the boys wherever you go in the communities. I like challenging the men, the fathers, we, the fathers, that when their mothers were not normal. Because for my mother, for my sister to be normal, they have to menstruate. This is normal, period. Bottom line, menstruate, normal. And that's it. I sometimes fail to understand it. Because me, I've, I've made it so normal that I even know the days my girls menstruate, my wife, apart from my sisters whom now are old and like I'm not staying with them. But I know these days, I know when they are going through them, the extent that it is so simple for my daughter to come and confide in me, you know what daddy, you know what uncle, I have two days to my periods and I'm remaining with one pad. So in the evening on your shopping list, please think about me. And that will be number one priority for me to pick I will not pick bread, but I will pick a, bag, a pad for my daughter. So, us as men, the role for us as men is actually to make menstruation so normal, break the stigma, break the barriers, break everything, and we will see our, our sisters, our wives, our daughters so happy to the extent that them themselves, you see, I won't blame the female MPs who, who turned against their, their, their fellow MPs. This is because 
they have been brought up in that way that this is our thing, we need high deep. Why do you ashamed us? You get? So because they've been brought up in that way, even at that level, they feel this is something that should be hidden. But this is not. Because, for example, now we are in a economically empowered world where we work with our fellow sisters uh, in the same environment. Sometimes, you see when we talk about menstruation, sometimes even this grown up, this thing can attack when you least, you less expect it. You know that you still have three days to go. And because of whatever is there, it attacks you today and you are not prepared. So you are seated in this beautiful conference. Before you know it, you feel you have something and it's flowing. So what do you do? You are seated around men. So if these men are not empowered to help you, I'm telling you, you will die. You will psychologically die as a female. So, but if it is normalized, then if you are seated next to Nehemiah, it does not take me a second to pull up my jacket and say, my sister, please cover yourself. And then if you don't have a gun, drink for you one and you help yourself and life moves on normally. So for us as men, the role of men, most men in our African society, we are the breadwinners. And as one of the, uh, one of the participants, as already put it, uh, it's unfortunate that these sanitary towels, sanitary pads are still expensive. So since men are the breadwinners, that means we are the one who, maybe I, I don't want them like, but we, we still have money. We are the ones with the money to help our daughters, our sisters, our, our wives access these pads. So as men, it's our responsibility to make sure that these things are available that these pads are available in financing the availability and in advocating for the availability of these pads. And that's what uh, my biggest role is at Raising Teenagers, making sure that the information is out there that we break stigma. Well, uh, sorry, I'll bring this up. We've decided as Raising Teenagers, as part of breaking the stigma around menstruation, we do an annual event where we organize people around us, friends, colleagues, blah, blah, blah. We contribute some money and we go into a certain community for a hike. We've been doing hikes. We want to bring in walks. We want to bring in running events. And we sensitize the community about menstruation. And we normally like it when we have men on board. Because a man who understands menstruation will promote it actually even more than a female. So we do, we, we, do, we do annual hikes. So when we do annual hikes, we make sure that the proceeds we buy some pads and go and distribute them uh, as we talk about menstruation. And we like men taking lead because you see me, when I stand in front of my fellow men and talk about these things on menstruation, demonstrate how a pad is, be, is put on by, by a female, then another man down there will be like, hey, this thing is normal. I can actually touch. You know, there is where I went and I was mad. They were laughing at me because I was touching the neck. And then I was point blank. I was like, you ladies, these men undress you. They remove these knickers when you are going into an act. But they, he doesn't want to touch it for you to, you know, to show you, to help you put on a pad. What kind of inconsistency is this? You get so the role of us men is embrace and make sure that these sanitary towels are available for our sisters, our wives, our children. That's the biggest role of our men. And two, men we should help the community and help these ladies to break the stigma around menstruation. We fight stigma, we'll be okay, and availability will follow. Whatever we are talking about, the hygiene, the sanitation, the availability of water, everything. The moment we break the stigma, things will be good to go. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Yeah, thank you very much for that context. And many people have said before that uh, if we, uh, if uh, if men used to menstruate or if men used to get pregnant, many of these things actually would have improved. You know, it's. Men, because of society and all that, men still hold um, 
a lot of power, structural power, that uh, that they do not necessarily also understand the, the plight of the others. But if men used to menstruate or men used to get pregnant, I'm telling you, many things would have improved, you know. <laughs> but because of that, many times men who still hold this much power are not seeing this as important. Now, I want us to go into our last, last, last question. And that is, is it time now for us to have uh, comprehensive sexuality education in, 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 in schools or in society as uh, given priority? Uh, I don't know if we all understand what uh, sexuality, comprehensive sexuality education is, but essentially, uh, just a quick Wikipedia definition says uh, sexuality education, comprehensive sexuality education is a sex education in, Instruction method based on curriculum that aims to give students the knowledge, attitudes, skills, and values to make appropriate and healthy choices in their sexual lives. And also part of the components that are taught in, in comprehensive sexuality education is, of course, relationships, values, rights, including the, uh, the health rights that girls are entitled to, cultural and sexuality, understanding gender, uh, violence, and staying safe, skills for health and well-being, skills, um, uh, the human body and development, um, reproductive health, name it. So I, and this has been quite controversial for sure in Uganda, opposed by many misfolders. I would like to have um, your views before we close on that. Over to you, Linda. And if, if you also don't have a comment on this, it's also okay. <laughs> Come again, the question. Yes, is it time for us to have a comprehensive sexuality education as part of the curriculum in, 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 in schools and even in our communities, societies? Is it now time that it becomes part of uh, the things that are given priority in our communities and schools, uh, comprehensive sexuality education, as you've had me define it, give it a simple, as you know, from the simple definition I've given, there are very many other definitions, of course. Yeah, thank you, Martin. I think it's high time, yeah, we should give this a priority in society and in schools. Reason being that a lot is happening, a lot is happening in our society towards children who are growing up now into future, leaders or people tomorrow. So I think first and foremost in schools, we really need to really put up the senior, the senior women teachers have been there initially before, but I think in some schools they've not been so active. So now I think as the government, as the community leaders, now we need to put in much effort and wake up these senior, senior women teachers who were once in schools and maybe dormant. Now I think it's high time they really need to come up and put across various issues concerning the growth and development of these children in terms of the sexuality, the body changes and the likes. I think they really need to come up and sensitize children or make them aware that growing up is a natural thing and it's part of life. Because we find that children who do not know, who are not, you know, we are in life, but. So we need, we need a very serious call upon the senior women teachers or even schools who have not yet embraced enrolling those senior women teachers or even the men, the senior men teachers also for the part of boys to come up and seriously have these topics discussed, reproductive health, sexuality part of it and the likes. So I think we really need a wake up call to the schools and the likes. Thank you, moderator. Thank you very much, Linda, for mm -hmm. it. Uh, uh, succinct, uh, succinct uh, uh, um, contribution. It's you know spot on. Over to you, Marion. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if you allow me, I uh, wanted just to to break down a holistic approach to uh, menstrual hygiene management. Okay, we have to look at it in three folds. The first one has to do with material and markets, and I think we have extensively looked at it, uh, such as removing entry market barriers for private sector, so these things can be much more cheaper. Um, it would also do with improving uh, accessibility of menstrual products. 
who is reducing the prices? Why are these things so high? Then we also need to break the st stigma and misinformation. Those all need to happen. Then enforce female friendly facilities and we've discussed it. The other fold is around um, information and education and it's the one we are tackling right now. Uh, I also know the government has recently introduced sexual sexuality education in the curriculum and I'm hoping this will bridge that gap of lack of information but I don't want to put the entire responsibility on schools. I think as parents, as families, as guardians, we are the first, we, God placed these kids as our responsibility and we need to take that seriously. It starts with us. So these kids, uh, I, I, I'm a believer that when a child clicks 12, you should start sexuality education. Start telling them what changes their body will go through start telling them what they'll need, start telling them what is a no and what is a yes, so that they, they start forming boundaries early. This goes for the boys too. I feel like today in the world that we are living in, it's not like in the past where there was not so much exposure. We have so much exposure that if you as a parent don't diligently do take take on your responsibility, the world or technology or other people will do it for you and you won't like the outcome. So you first need to take responsibility as a guardian. Have these conversations with these kids. By the way, these kids understand beyond what we think they do. I feel like we are still so stuck in the past or the traditional system and we think that certain conversations that are not supposed to be held, not realizing that times have changed, circumstances have changed, and these kids need to have these talks very early. And one thing I've realized about children is that just telling them to do things and not explaining to them why certain things shouldn't happen or why they should do certain things and not do certain things causes rebellion on their side. It, it causes them to want to go out there and experiment. It causes them to want to go out there and find out the truth for themselves. But if you're honest with these kids and explain to them the repercussions of each decision they take, they'll make informed decisions, empower them with information. I believe in empowering every child with information so that even if you're not there, they can make their own decisions. They will know what is right and what is wrong because there's no guarantee that you'll be there for the rest of their lives. But at least they should know how to, to, to navigate life and get the basics. And they should know respect for others. This goes for boys and girls. Uh, even as the schools also uh, try to create facilities that um, will enable friendly uh, environments for our girls. And uh, the other thing we need to address culture or harmful culture and social norms and practices related to um, menstrual hygiene. We can't discuss menstrual hygiene without looking at the norms and the beliefs around these things because our minds are still conservative. And it, we need to address those issues if we are to move forward. You know, sometimes we ignore and think just because you have moved, everyone else has moved and is thinking like you, but you'll be shocked. Just like that video that we recently uh, saw. Like you're shocked. These are exposed, educated people and, and this is what is coming out. So imagine those people on the grassroots. Then for me, the other issue would be around um, ensuring we provide uh, quality and sustainable menstrual materials and supportive materials. Just providing free pads is not enough. Can we look at sustainability? Can we get um, materials that are actually sustainable that girls don't have to keep buying, okay? Then the last one is around, uh, show them how these things are supposed to use, sorry, to work, and then promote, promote more social enterprises if government can not provide them, can we then empower private enterprises that are closer to the public to provide these things? That's what I would say, thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, 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 for that. And uh, over to you, Nehemiah, in a few minutes, we close. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Alex, the moderator. Uh, on comprehensive sexual education, I would say yes, but we need help policy designers to develop a curriculum that will help us disseminate or educate our children according to what their brains can carry. 
let's not teach a child of six years what we should be teaching a child of 16 years. When we are done with that, then I would say, yes, let's not carry everything at all times. So we develop a curriculum that will help us give the sex education to the child according to the capacity of their brains. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Yes, thank you very much uh, for that, Maya. Yeah, I mean, for sure, uh, the issue of um, comprehensive sexuality education has been a contentious one. Uh, in schools, among stakeholders, we know that churches and churches own very many schools, and uh, it has always been an issue. But also, we must understand that much of our society is a conservative society where issues to do with um, bodily autonomy, issues to do with the body as a sexual being are rarely talked about. So it's understandable to see that there are still um, reservations in this, on, on this issue. And government has tried to, to you know, tried to, um, sensitize, debate, engage with stakeholders. There are still many issues, but also we must um, recognize that uh, many of these things are embedded in patriarchy. You know, it's still the men that decide what should be and what should not be. And men always, but men define things. They define what a woman's body should be, what should be done on a woman's body. And such things are, that are the things we don't want to see. We want women to be in charge of their bodies, in charge of decisions, and to know, you know, much about who they are and their bodies for the better. And it will also help in the hygiene, but also it will help men normalize the, the differences in people, the difference between a man and a woman, you know. Once we have men or boys who know that indeed it's okay for a girl to go through these cycles. It's okay, and I should be compassionate. I should understand that my colleague whom I'm studying with is going through this, and I should be of help to them, you know, as opposed to where information is hidden and issues of menstrual hygiene or menstruation are like a mystery. You know, we grew up in that time when these were mysteries. I never knew I understood I never actually I don't remember any time knowing that my sister was going through you know her menstrual cycles and this is because she had to hide because it was taken as a shameful thing you know so it's high time I think that all of us as a society we understood that you know sexual sexual reproductive rights will empower each and everyone and will promote better health um for all of us and to also understand each other in a better way. Young boys should be empowered to understand issues of women because as we stand, there is still a big imbalance where many decisions of women are still being made by men. If men do not understand, they are going to still make decisions that suppress women. But also, if they do not understand, they will continue holding on to this power and not let it go, which is disastrous to society and to humanity, you know, because we are all equal part uh, sharers in this life, in humanity. And what we discussed earlier about child marriages, we have to work together to end this, you know, in all our communities, Religious leaders, we know that there are still religious practices that do not recognize 18 years as the age of majority for marriage. We just call upon those religious leaders, all those religious groups that think that way. And this, I also mean African traditional religion. Let us see what our constitution says. 18 years, there is no debate about that. You know, and this has been also supported by psychologists and also doctors it is who have studied the human body. And by 18, they understand that maybe at that point, the person has reached a certain level of maturity. 
My own view is that 18 is still young, <laughs> you know, but at least the science has shown that 18 may be. Let us respect that. In our communities, let us respect that these girls, these young people are not yet ready. Let us give them a chance to study, to make their own future, and later for them to make their own decisions. And as uh, this show, community show, we shall continue to advocate for the rights of girls, the rights of women without ending. We shall continue to speak out. We shall continue to host amazing uh, discussions like Marion, Linda, and Nehemiah to help us understand this issue. We believe that one day, uh, accumul and cumulatively, society will change and many things will change for the better. I have been your host, Martin, and I wish you a great week. Mm -hmm.